This next video is primarily on oak trees. And there are so many different varieties of oak trees. And I'm going to touch on a few here. California has its own unique set of oak trees that you may never see. You may never encounter. Um, the primary oak tree in California is the uh, coast live oak, which uh, it's probably the most abundant of all of them. But then we have a lot of other types of live oaks as well. I'm going to be talking a bit about the canyon live oak. Uh, and down in the lowlands, uh, we have an entirely different grouping of oak trees. You know, we have the the valley oaks growing down there, as well as many, many other species of oak. So wherever you live, I'm sure you have your own varieties of oak tree that, that you find um, have their own unique characteristics. And every oak tree behaves differently. When I say, when I mean behaves, um, when you make a cut, some of them will hold on longer. The, the, the branches will, um, peel off, you know, at a, at a different ratio. And you have to understand and learn every single unique aspect of the oak trees that you're dealing with. So without further ado, let's, uh, there's a bit longer video. Um, I hope you appreciate it. This is more of the, you know, the tree decisions, um, videos. And I've got a lot of them that we talk a lot about, uh, inspecting the trees and coming up with on uh, understanding uh, of decay and understanding of weaknesses. And a lot of times, um, you, all you can do is, is come up with the best educated guess. So I hope you follow along. I hope you find this really interesting. Uh, I think it's a, it's a valuable training tool, especially for a, a younger aspiring arborist, as well as somebody who's been at it for a long time. I do point out some mistakes. I'm not afraid to point out some mistakes. The crew made a couple of errors. And I, I know there's going to be a bit of eye rolling, but that's also a way to educate someone. I think that you need to see the mistakes in order to learn why it's a mistake. So let's go take a look at smoke trees. Well, let's talk about oak trees. We had an entire week this last week of trimming nothing but different oak trees. But let's start off first with the first job, which was a mountain job. And I couldn't help myself. It was so beautiful. I had to get my drone out. And <laughs> I, as you know, I'm a rock climber. And whenever I see interesting rocks for bouldering or climbing, I, I, I just can't help myself. So this particular house that I went to was up in the mountains, but it was pretty much built on top of some beautiful, beautiful rocks. It's on private property, and I'd love to go down there and do a bit more exploring, but getting the drone out, I, <laughs> that's such an amazing tool. I, I mean, we've had drones for a long time, but I'm just truly mesmerized by this technology. So here's the first tree. It's a canyon live oak, and it, it completely died. It uh, is likely uh, killed off by the sudden oak death, the Phytophthora remorum, uh, but I can't say for sure because I didn't have it tested, but the likelihood is very real. So we got this job of cutting this one tree down and you can see I, got the, I was able to get the bucket in there and get started on it. We couldn't get the back part, part of it. So this is a job I did just uh, Kalen and myself it was a little bit of a difficult job because the, the steepness of the hillside. So we left a couple of gin poles up there so we could swing all the brush back in. And right behind it is yet another huge dead canyon live oak. Um, it's the uh, Quercus chrysiopolis. I hope I pronounced that right. Uh, it's um, it's interesting. It's a, it's a live oak that only grows up at the higher elevations. You don't see it down in the lowlands very much at all. Now I'll show you a little bit more of the, the area. It was such a steep, tight location that I opted to tow a chipper in here. And I'm using the old 200. I don't get this chipper out too often, 
Um, and unfortunately, we had a little bit of a difficulty with that chipper. The, the detent valve kind of messed up on it. So the, re, um, the, uh, the reverse was really messing up on us. So we had a bit of a bit of an issue. There's yet another pretty rock. Look at that cave in there. Some of the, some of the sandstone rocks and the formations we have up here in the Santa Cruz Mountains are, are just truly remarkable. Let's talk a little bit about fire. This area was saved in the fires, but just off in the distance there behind all the trees that you're looking at, uh, the, the hillside along the back there, it all burned. And thankfully, uh, thankfully our local firefighters got it out. I'm having a little bit of fun here with the drone. I'll get onto the tree work here soon. Don't worry. <laughs> But I am am enjoying it. I'm doing this at lunchtime. So there's that old 200. It still works pretty good, but the 250, I have the Bandit 250, is is a much much better machine. I don't recommend buying the 200. I don't even know if they sell that one anymore. I know they sell a 150. My friend Jeff has the 150. Anyway, enough of this drone stuff. Let's get on to the work. Here we are on yet another job. Uh, this was Tuesday's job. This was really interesting. This is a valley oak, uh, Quercus lobata. They grow down in the low, lowlands. They're one of the most beautiful oak trees that we have down here. And unfortunately, this tree is growing in a well. Actually, the well was built around the tree because the tree is likely 150 years old. Interestingly, these trees grow very convoluted and twisted. A lot of times the branches will, will, will almost tie themselves into knots. And there's a little bit higher up. I had to do an inspection of this tree. Uh, so I get up there in the bucket. And, um, beautiful, beautiful tree. But when I show you the, the roots of this tree, you're going to be wondering whether we should keep this tree or not. And I, I too, am questioning the the structural stability with the potential weakness in the root, root system. It, it, it becomes very obvious when, when you see it. I'll, I'll show you in a bit. Beautiful tree. Um, there's a lot of foliage coming out. It's brand new foliage. It's springtime, so everything is just barely leafing out. Here's uh, one of the spots up high. I saw it from down low and I wanted to inspect it. And interestingly, there's, there's a lot of active tissue trying to enclose this wound, but it doesn't seem to be too rotted on the inside, which that was uh, that was kind of a pleasant surprise for me. I counted 12 cables in this tree, and all the cables were doubled up. So apparently somebody cabled the tree a long time ago and came back years later and said, okay, those aren't strong enough, let's charge you again, and they redid it. Are those cables important? Are they valuable? Um, I couldn't see any really obvious weaknesses in any of the crotches, so I honestly believe this was a uh, this was a way to make some money. Somebody sold them on the previous owner. Actually, it's not this owner; it was the previous owner a long, long time ago. They sold them on keeping the tree safe. And fear is a great motivator for selling people jobs. So, if you have this enormous tree in your front yard. And somebody comes along and says, we can cable it and make it safe. Er, all right, here we go. Here's the, the root system. The Probably the same company got in there and did a, um, a root excavation, um, either with a, an air tool or, or something else that got in there um, and opened it up so you can see what's going on. Okay, this is some of the, the new growth that's coming out on the tree. I just I thought this was really beautiful, so I wanted to show some close-ups of, of the new growth. Sometimes when a tree sprouts out and you have all the brand new uh, foliage on it, 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 to me, I think it's just amazing. So I looked at lots and lots of wounds in the trees. And some of them had woodpecker holes associated with them, and there was actually some hollows where you could see that uh, a bird had gotten inside. There we go. See that woodpecker hole on the right-hand side? So what you see on the outside is not necessarily what is going on inside. So you have to be really careful when you 
look at a, a wound from the ground because oftentimes it's different. Oh, that is interesting. Yeah, the previous owner wanted to keep that low limb, but this one said, let's get it out of there. I also looked at the tree in the backyard, which we ended up working on. This one is growing right up and under the foundation of the house. It also had a, um, a, a raised area around the base of the tree where it was a root crown excavation to better inspect it. This one was not near as hollowed out as the tree in the front yard, but well, I tell you, it's still, it's down in a well, and you can see the, the root system very, very clearly. Typically, the dirt would be up another, oh, 20, 20 inches or so higher than what you can see here. So this is the tree in the front yard. This is the one that I'm doing the, uh, the, ins the deeper inspection on. And this tree really, it really has me somewhat concerned. I mean, there's a lot of, of roots in here that from the top look fairly sound, but when you get up underneath them, you can see that the underside of many of these roots are decayed. So there's how big this tree is. That's uh, that's another issue. Uh, so the client asked me, I said, so if this tree falls, will it fall towards the house or will it fall away from the house? Wow, that's a loaded question. So let's get on to yet another job. Um, this job, I had to uh, get out the um, the APTA, the air-powered uh, throw ball launcher, which I'm learning to absolutely love. When I first got it, I was a little dubious because I didn't quite understand it. But now that I'm, I'm figuring out the, the pressures and the associated, how much pressure to you know, get a good shot up into the air, I've got this expensive bicycle pump and it has a nozzle on it that um, you, if you push down on it, it pumps into the the tire, or in this case, the, the APTA. And then if you pull back the little red collar on it, it holds the pressure and doesn't lose any. So I can get a very accurate reading on how many pounds of pressure to, to put in there for certain heights. And through experience, there, there's that little unit there. I paid about $120 for that bicycle pump alone. Um, it was the best one I, I could find. It has a pressure gauge that goes up to 220 psi, um, which is, is more than you're supposed to put in the APTA. The APTA has a, a maximum pressure of 200 psi. And honestly, I've never put anything more than about 160 into it. But you can see I'm, I'm reading the pressure there very carefully. I looked at this particular shot and did an estimation on how much so you pull up on it and it doesn't lose any air at all, except for what's in the bicycle pump hose, which is virtually nothing. At this point, this becomes a dangerous weapon. If you were to accidentally uh, pull this lever back and you don't have it pointed where you want it to go, it could get scary. So I want to hit that spot way, way up there. Let's see how well I do. Yes. Ah. And it comes right back to me. When that happens, that's just like, oh, that just made my day. Really, really enjoyed it. I'm still at the same job site. We had a number of oak trees to work on on this property. They had, um, oh, probably 40 or 50 different oak trees. It was a big property. This is something that was offered by uh, Tree Stuff, and I don't believe they're selling it anymore. I hope so. It's called the Bonner Double Bag, and I was actually gifted this bag few years ago and, and I've learned to absolutely love it. It holds two throw balls and has an area for additional bags, not balls, bag, you know, throw bags. So it, it's just a, a great setup and it really works out well. There's that tree in the backyard. This is uh, I'm kind of bouncing around here a little bit between jobs. Um, this is the job from before. I, I have these a little out of order. And I'm inspecting this tree, trying to make tree decisions. What should I do in terms of potential failures? When I see something like this, I think, how strong is that? This is yet another tree. This is a black oak, Quercus guy. And I got up there with a bucket to do an inspection, and I found this. I was able to put my handsaw 
all the way down. If I let go of it, I would have lost it. But the homeowner couldn't see this. So this also tells me that there's a significant weakness in there. So maybe we need to take more weight off of this tree. You know, when you find things like this, these tree decisions often have some answers. So this was given to me. The, the client's wife made this little map of the property of the trees she was particularly interested in getting taken care of. And, and obviously the trees around the house, she was quite nervous about squirrels and rats jumping on the roof. So um, clearing any low branches will absolutely keep the, all the rats off the roof. And while I was over there in that black oak, I noticed something. And I had to go over and look at it closer, but um, it was a shadow. And if, if you see where those dots are, it was telling me something happened there a long time ago. So I walked around the backside of this limb and part of it had split out. It was growing all the way up and around. And there was also this, this uh, growth on it. Uh, the adjacent tree had been spurred many, many times in the past. It's always interesting to look at what has happened to trees in years past. And some of the observations I make it takes a little bit of detective work, but uh, it, it's kind of fun to, to figure these things out. So what I'm seeing in this tree is a significant weakness at the base, which tells me that this long outstretching limb is likely going to break. Now, next year, 10 years from now, I don't know, but it's going to break. So I'm going to take all this weight off all the way back to that left-hand side. There's an upright way at the upper top left-hand corner. So I'm going to get um, some significant weight off of this and hopefully it can survive. And interesting, the tree right next to it uh, had evidence of an old tree house or something of the sort. There's a lot of nails in the tree. <laughs> Those damn ants again. We run into ants in live oaks. This is a, a, a Quercus agrifolia, which is one of the more common oak trees on uh, in California. We, it's probably the most prominent one. Here's um, a live oak that is almost gone. I told them they ought to get rid of it, but the, the woman said it was, she couldn't, couldn't do it until it's totally dead. And I said, okay, well, let's at least get the major dead limbs off of the, the driveway and the ugly eyesores. And that looks like evidence of Phytophthora. I can't say whether it's Phytophthora remorum or another one of the Phytophthora. There's, there's a whole lot of different Phytophthora diseases. And they, a lot of them have that weeping, which is, is uh, evidence of the Phytophthora. So I've got a guy that I've been training for the last six months. Um, I think he shows real, real promise. He doesn't have a lot of fear, but uh, we were talking to him. He said, make an undercut and then come down from the top. Well, he didn't quite understand it, so he made the top cut and came up from the bottom, which was absolutely wrong. He pulled it off, but uh, we had to talk about it. There's Daniel. Daniel's going to be leaving us pretty soon because he's also a firefighter, and he's going up to Alaska to work up there for a few months. And I'm hoping he comes back because I see real promise in this guy. I think he's got a future in this industry. You know, a lot of times I get clients who ask me questions about what kind of trees they should plant for privacy. You know, maybe they don't want to see the neighbor's house or maybe they're trying to block the view of a road. Well, I've got a client here who has a fairly large estate property. And about 15 years ago, he planted a grouping of redwood trees and birch trees for privacy. And interestingly, he planted two redwood trees right here you see the two tops up there and it created a fairly nice dense amount of privacy down down low but actually the trees were planted fairly close together so unfortunately if one of these trees should die the remaining tree is going to be fairly sparse on one side the birch trees they didn't uh, last very long for privacy because the trunks get exposed as they get taller and taller so now he has nice birch trees, but very little privacy from that. Now to contrast this, he planted 12 
redwood trees over here. And the redwood trees have gotten quite tall. They're all about 60 feet tall. But the difference here is because they were planted so tight together, the privacy is going away. The understory limbs are getting overshadowed and the crowding between these trees is making them very, very sparse and very thin. So I'm going to guess in the next decade or so, all they're going to have is trunks down low and they're going to lose all the privacy and they're going to have these really tall, skinny trees. So the reality of it is, here's a location where there are two redwood trees. Or maybe there's a third small one over there. Okay, so there's one, two, three. So the two dominant ones are the primaries. Now, had they planted one redwood tree in the middle, it would have had the same amount of foliage, but it would have been balanced all the way around and it would have been thicker still. So in this area, had they planted three redwood trees, one, two, three, all three of those trees would have grown up like this thickness over here and they would have had privacy all the way down to the ground and it could have stayed that way for a long time. So what I'm getting to here is a lot of times more is less. You really have to understand what a tree is going to evolve into so that you can make the right planting decisions as well as the spacing of the trees. You have to know what it's going to evolve into and how the long-term effects of crowding are going to affect what you're trying to achieve. And from a distance, they look like they're all planted in a straight line, but you can see they are interspersed and they're all about six feet apart. That was about five feet apart. But if you look up in between the trees, you can see that the foliage on these is only where they're getting sunlight. So the insides of all the trees are going sparse. All right, look at that. You see the line down on the right? This was cut from the ground with a pole saw and they cut into it. After I took that off, you can see how much decay was in there. The oh, pollen. Oh, I hate the pollen. There's so much pollen in this time of year. You can probably hear it in my voice. I've been choking and, and coughing up lately, um, which makes masking up all the more valuable. And I did wear a mask just to uh, keep the pollen out of my my throat for this job. So uh, Jorge's up here cutting all the weight off of this and he should have done an undercut on this. I asked him about it. He says, oh, I'm going so much further back. It would have been just fine. And I don't know. I think it's always better to play it safe. And even a small undercut keeps it from ripping because you don't know how far that rip is going to go. Some woods will break off real fast. Other woods tear the bark and it'll pull it for sometimes, you know, eight or ten feet. So uh, I was a little irritated with that cut, but um, we got a lot of, this is the branch that I, I looked at the, uh, the weakness from a distance and it all worked out and you see this, this way past the rip. We're going all the way back to this upright. I think we probably took about a thousand pounds or more off the end of this long, uh, this, this long piece here. So even though it's got a weakness on it, um, I think it can survive. And finally, we're on to yet uh, another job. This is Friday's job. Um, we've got a valley oak. And this is, oh, this was a beautiful tree. This tree had never had any serious cuts made on it. Nobody's taken off any large wounds. It was almost a virgin tree. I did do some deadwooding on it about 10 years ago. Uh, but uh, it's, it's so nice to find a tree that has not been butchered by another tree service in the past. And that's really rare. This tree is not that old, maybe 40, 50 years old. And finally, let's go to yet another oak tree. This one's not very common. This is a cork oak, Quercus suber. This is an imported tree. We find them from time to time. And this is actually what cork uh, for bottles is made from. In Portugal, they harvest the bark off of these trees, and amazingly, the trees survive. Uh, you should, if you Google it and look it up, it's, it's amazing how they pull these great big sheets off of these trees, and, and somehow they, they survive. Um, there, there's the, the leaves of the cork oak. 
real pretty tree. They're also susceptible to the Phytophthora disease. And there's that virgin uh, valley oak. Uh, just a beautiful, beautiful tree. Fortunately, she did not want us to overdo it. Well, like I said, that was a longer video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to my channel, hit the like button, and if you want to hear the next upcoming videos, there's a little bell that you can hit in there, and, and that'll notify you of uh, the next video that's coming up. Thanks so much for all of your um, comments and um, all of your support. Stay strong, stay safe.